So I recently had the pleasure of speaking at a workshop about art and creative AI down in Vienna. Uh, I was very excited to be invited by Han from Gina AI to participate in this. And so I wanted to share the talk from that event here on this channel. Uh, in any case, please enjoy the talk. My, I'm going to be giving a talk that's a little complimentary to what we just heard from Han, which was an excellent uh, talk, by the way. And um, I've called this one, Creative AI is changing our visual culture, but perhaps not in the way that you might think. Um, so I want to begin by giving a little background on myself so that you know where I'm coming from. Uh, so my background is not as an AI person. I'm actually a graphic designer uh, and lettering artist, and I've worked in corporate branding, visual identity mostly through that time. Uh, I'm also a communicator and educational YouTuber. Um, and then I've, I'm a bit of an AI and ML enthusiast, early adopter. One of my best friends uh, in London did his master's in machine learning and got me hooked, uh, telling me about all these uh, models like BERT and stuff early on. And so I've kind of tried to, uh, anything that I can access that's kind of in development, get my hands on super resolution, GTP3 tools, uh, synthetic video, anything that I can play with. And um, so I want to begin with a terrible question, um, and that is, what is art? Now, I recommend asking this question if you want to seem like a pretentious dickhead to any of your friends, associates. Um, I really dislike this question, um, and I think that's because art is not a very helpful word in this context. Uh, that's because this is art. Uh, you know, we're here in Vienna, home of Gustav Klimt and a lot of amazing artists, but also this is art. You can go into any Ikea, uh, any Walmart or equivalent and find this whole category called wall art. Um, this is art as well. If you, go, if you go online, you'll find a lot of this kind of art. And it serves its own function, and all three uh, use the same word. So um, I don't want to talk so much about art today, even though that's what the workshop was called. Um, the question I really want to focus on is, why do humans make images, and how do we use them? And that's, uh, this kind of comes down to what has spurred this moment, which is the rise of text-to-image AI. So that is like DALI, DALI 2 from OpenAI. We have Google Imogen and Party is a, a new one they've got, and Meta slash Facebook have got their own one coming down the pipe. And so everybody's quite uh, excited about this. In fact, um, announced just a couple of days ago, they're going to let a million people on the, on the waiting list for DALI 2 have access in the next few weeks. Uh, and the thing that doesn't get said uh, out loud very often is that not all text is literature, and not every image is art. But that is a good thing. It's not a value judgment. And I think that we understand this a bit better when it comes to text because we've had GTP3 and other um, large language model uh, AI systems for a while, and we know that text covers a lot of different kinds of scenarios. Code is a kind of text when it's broken down into what kind of medium it is. Uh, and so we have GitHub Copilot. Um, we have a lot of kind of commercial text like cold emails, marketing, copywriting, um, and customer support chatbots. We also, of course, have traditional fiction, narrative fiction. There's a t great tool I use a lot called PseudoWrite. And interactive fiction, like uh, AI Dungeon, if you want to play a Dungeon Master with a chatbot, is very good. Uh, in fact, if you go to the uh, showcase site GTP3 demo, there's over 100 categories of different uh, uses that this uh, text model has. When it comes to image making, uh, obviously that encompasses somewhat of art and somewhat of design. Um, and there are certainly things in design that aren't image making. So sound design is its own discipline. Also in art, you know, Marina Abramovich, famous uh, performance artist, does not make images. But it actually is a lot more fuzzy than that. Image making as a cultural practice uh, covers everything from those to photography to data visualization. Uh, generated images not only by AI, but also by code and uh, generative art through um, tools like processing. Uh, we have, yeah, all of these different things fall under the rubric of image making. And the reasons why we do these things come from not only self-expression and expression of identity, but also community, a communion and community with other people that shared uh, human experience, saying something about that. Uh, it might be to entertain or demonstrate social value. 
So I want to break things down in my analysis today into just like four sections. Uh, first, I want to talk about the design process because that's my kind of area and, and kind of set some groundwork there. Uh, then go to a bit of an, a face-off um, uh, showdown <laughs> between AI and human uh, applications of creativity. Uh, then we'll look at kind of a broader context of historic disruptions in different media and where this might fit in. And finally, look at some opportunities and challenges that come from working with technology that's right on the cutting edge. So design disciplines vary widely and cover a huge range of different uh, specific design uh, industries. So architecture, obviously packaging design, uh, fashion design, illustration, advertising, uh, down to you know, poster making for, for music. And these all vary in how rigid the constraints are. So obviously architects have to work with uh, building codes uh, and very strict uh, measurements of is it up to these constraints. And a chair has to obviously hold a person's weight. But some of these things like you know, music posters and album art, they don't have these same kind of rigid constraints to them and are much more like traditional uh, creative art. Uh, this is the design process broken down. Uh, I talked about this in a video that Han was a uh, guest on, which was, uh, will AI replace graphic designers? And um, there's basically five stages that I broke down the, the creative process in. And it begins with the client brief, which you can kind of think is like an equivalent to the prompt. Um, but it's a bit more interactive than that. Normally, uh, the client doesn't come in and just say one sentence to you and turn around and leave. Uh, it takes a little bit of conversation to actually try and dig because design is about problem solving and you really want to find out that you are solving the right problem before you get too deep. Then we have our research, looking for informational re uh, research and inspirational research with mood boards, uh, the actual generation of creative uh, possibilities with visual brainstorming, uh, and then refactoring, trying to uh, come up with variations on the, the ideas. Uh, this goes back to the client for feedback and revisions, and this cycle continues until we get to a uh, resolution when we can deliver the outcome. And in uh, my earlier video, I kind of talked about where AI kind of fits into this workflow as the tools are today. Um, so that would be kind of in that inspirational mood board gathering. Uh, you can definitely get some interesting kind of reference points out of these AI systems. Uh, the, the visual brainstorming and refactoring, and that's down to the strengths and weaknesses of AI versus humans. Um, the strengths of AI is that it has speed and scale unlike uh, anything a human can produce. It's very good at mood and tone, and it can surprise you with its... Um, non-human way of interpreting things, which is, which is great for the creative process. It's also inexhaustible and cheap, which people tend to not be. Um, but its weaknesses are that it cannot explain its creative choices to you, uh, which, which makes it a frustrating creative partner. Um, it's not very good at fine details if you pixel peep, and we'll have a look at a little bit of that uh, later. It doesn't work, when we're talking about these particular systems, it doesn't work beyond raster graphics because they're trained on pixel data. Uh, so it doesn't do things like uh, vector graphics, it doesn't do layouts and typography. Uh, it has a problem with consistency where Han talked about non-repeatability, uh, but then also trying to take an idea in, in one context and move it uh, to another context while keeping the same visual is, is nearly impossible with the tools as they exist. And lastly, it lacks contextual understanding that a person does. Um, so I wanted to, rather than just talking about it in the abstract, actually kind of showcase some of this with a challenge of reverse engineering some creative outcomes uh, with some of these tools. And uh, I want to begin with a disclaimer because I'm going to put this on the internet and I will get comments about this, for sure. <laughs> I'm not claiming to be a very good prompt engineer. Uh, and in fact, some of these uh, Watching Han's presentation, I was like, oh, I probably should have rephrased it that way to get a better outcome. But I think the discourse or the, the, the talk at the moment uh, is that, oh, it will be simple to replace uh, human creatives with AI. And so I've taken a little bit of a naive approach with how I've, I've prompted uh, the systems uh, to kind of showcase if it was really that easy uh, or if it, it's difficult to coax a good outcome out of it. So the first 
uh, kind of case study I wanted to look at was conceptual illustration. So there's obviously, you know, very straightforward illustration. O oftentimes uh, in industry, it's called spot illustration. If you kind of have an article and it's saying um, he cooked, you know, a chicken, you do a drawing of a chicken, that's simple illustration. But these kind of conceptual illustrations um, often are used for editorials, like magazine articles. They're also used for book covers, all of these different uh, uses. And this is an uh, a, uh, illustration piece from Jio Wen Chen, who, this one's called Inside of Me. And I turned it into this prompt, which is uh, a scene of a woman navigating a giant maze shaped like a human head. At the left edge of the frame, we see leafy foliage and exotic plants, flat illustration style, Allegria style, which is uh, a reference to Facebook's illustration house style. So first I put it to disco art. <laughs> And it's interesting to see it, it, all of the elements are there. Um, I think actually, after seeing Hans talk, I think I know why disco art was the hardest to work with, probably because of my uh, prompting style. Uh, but all of the elements are there. The, the, there's a woman, there's a maze, and there's a head. Uh, but it's not really in any meaningful configuration compared to what was asked for. Uh, then we have results from Mid Journey, which is another um, uh, paid uh, subscription tool, uh, still in beta, but what's interesting here is that I don't think any of them really got the maze. I think maybe the, the closest one was this, which would be a very simple maze if you put it on the back of a cereal box. Um, <laughs> but there are some very interesting visual ideas here, like uh, we have kind of Cleopatra headdress made of, of leaves. Um, and this is Dali 2, uh, and it it definitely picked up on the Allegria style, which is that Facebook uh, illustration style, that flat illustration style. Uh, it, it definitely succeeded at that. And it, it maybe came the closest at combining all of the elements, but even so, it didn't quite work out. Uh, and kind of in summary, looking at those examples, what we can see, it, it does provide some really good color and style variations. If, you, if I was an illustrator and trying to use these tools to enhance my workflow, I go, okay, there's some, some inspiration I can take from the use of color. Uh, there's unexpected choices like that Cleopatra headdress and stuff that might spark a different uh, illustration or different approach. But it does struggle with visual and symbolic complexity, uh, at least you know, when it's phrased in natural language. Um, and I think my suspicion is that a composite approach would be much much more successful if I kind of fed it the components of this illustration one at a time. So asking for a maze shaped like a human head without all the rest and asking for a woman wandering in a maze and asking for plants, then I'd have to composite everything in Photoshop. And at that point it becomes, why don't I just do the whole thing myself? Um, but it's an interesting case study. My second one, which was even more challenging, is packaging design. Uh, and this is a packaging design for a gin. Uh, which was featured on Dye Line, which is like a blog about all kind of innovative packaging design. And I took most of this description from what they said about this uh, product. So a bottle and packaging designed for Indo-Japanese craft gin with attractive, vibrant colors and youthful flair paying tribute to Indian and Japanese botanicals. Um, so this kind of has things like yuzu and cinnamon and, and these kind of things in, the, in this gin. So disco art, uh, they, all of them actually picked up on the word botanicals to kind of mean floral, uh, interestingly. Uh, and this one definitely feels, um, it doesn't quite feel like the right category. It feels a little bit like um, beauty, beauty product kind of um, design language to me. Uh, but it, it is a plausible uh, outcome. This one I cherry picked out of uh, Mid Journey, but I think it's quite successful. It's believable as a set. Um, an interesting, an interesting that it's quite different. Uh, and Dali 2, uh, I think, had the least remarkable uh, designs, actually. These, these are a little bit, um, a little bit cliche, I think. <laughs> I'm being really showing how harsh I am on the AI. Um, but yeah, they are all believable results, but pretty vague on the detail. And the cliche, uh, I think, if you say design a floral bottle, I think to a, that what, what a designer might do is design some of those things. Um, maybe the botanicals keyword was, was a mistake, but it does demonstrate some particular shortcomings in the model or the training data, perhaps both. Uh, it 
cannot really handle uh, typography. And that is a huge uh, part of what this design actually does, is kind of combine uh, that interesting juxtaposition between uh, English text or Latin script and, uh, you know, uh, Devanagari, Indian, and uh, I'm not sure which of the three Japanese writing systems that is, but it's, it's kind of an interesting way of, of showcasing those kind of three cultures. And it also lacks the cultural understanding of context of this product category. So gin as a drink is often, uh, you know, mostly done around juniper, and it's kind of uh, associated with London dry gin. We have beef eater, we have Bombay Sapphire, all these kind of well-known ones that are all very British. And so the kind of point of interest, the point of difference in the product is its kind of national origins from an unexpected place. And the a human designer would know to pick up on this, but the AI doesn't have the context. So then I decided to eat, put the brakes on a little bit with the complexity of prompts. Uh, and I thought this was initially something I thought that the AI would really uh, knock out of the park, which was pattern design, because it's purely visual, really, in, in some ways, and quite simple. So this, uh, this prompt was inspired by uh, Untitled Goose Game, uh, which, is, uh, which is a very fun game. Uh, and my prompt was a seamless pattern a uh, repeating pattern of an angry goose in various poses, honking, flapping its wing, wings, and swimming. And um, they are patterns. Um, but if you look very closely at the anatomy, uh, you, you have, it leads to very many questions. <laughs> I think one looks like an exploded puffin of some kind. Uh, and Dali seems to believe that gooses have two necks. Um, so that's a, a bit of a problem. Uh, uh, but then we, we go into a different category of, of footwear design uh, because it kind of is fairly constrained. As I talked about like um, creative restraints within different design disciplines, footwear, it always kind of has the same components. It's got the sole, it has you know, the laces or, or whatever, especially with men's footwear. And, and I, I thought this would be an interesting prompt uh, to do a shoe around subway or underground um, uh, systems because that's something that I find interesting and I found some real-life shoes that I thought were really boring. Uh, I didn't really like these uh, real ones. I thought the, the London ones were too subtle and the New York one was ugly. So I thought maybe the AI can do a better job. Uh, so I gave it the prompt high top sneaker inspired by NYC subway map by Massimo Vignelli or limited edition London tube map Air Jordans. Uh, disco art, I don't know what parameter I set wrong initially, but it gave me some kind of, yes, this kind of gray mass. What I, what I ended up doing was giving it the outline, the kind of silhouette of, of a sneaker, and it did a much uh, better job. Uh, Mid Journey was very confused about the relationship uh, between a map and a shoe to where it would just make a limited edition print <laughs> of a shoe looking map, and I could not get it to shake out of this pattern. Um, and Dali 2 kind of came somewhere in the middle because it, it, it has, uh, half of the results have a shoe sitting on, on top of a map. Um, so yeah, interesting, interesting results. Uh, but I wanted to share a, a success story of this, of this kind of recreation. Um, maybe not these two. <clears throat> don't, don't, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do you a, f a favor by not zooming too close in on these faces. But Dali 2 is really doing some good work here if you want a stock photo cliche. So the prompt was a happy woman in her early 30s uh, eating salad and laughing, wearing a light gray top in a bright modern kitchen, uh, 50 millimeter natural daylight, and it's knocked out of the park. That is some real generic stock photo cliches. Um, but when it gets interesting is when you, you know, I said uh, pixel peeping, you get some real problems um, you know, in the face, uh, especially here. But uh, with, a, with adding a few other tools in, so there's GFP-GAN, which is kind of a facial uh, trained um, neural network, and adding Gigapixel, uh, Topaz Gigapixel, which is a commercially available upscaling uh, package, and kind of combining these layers in Photoshop, we get something very believable as a stock photo. Exactly. The, <laughs> thank goodness for the human uh, tendency to look at faces so you don't notice this horrible claw holding this <laughs> salad. As far as I know, there's no GFP GAN for hands. Um, so maybe in the future, if they can find a way of uh, 
yeah, restoring photos of hands, then we, we, we can put stock photographers out of business. But I think this, this is uh, one of the case uh, studies or, or scenarios that uh, was in the paper from OpenAI about potentially displacing industries. Uh, one of them that was called out was stock photography. And if you think about the model of stock pho photography, you have all of these different uh, photographers who create images, they shoot and edit and add metadata and upload these images to these uh, sites like Shutterstock and Getty. And then each user has to search through all of those images um, to find the right one and then they're consumed on. If we move to a synthetic model, we kind of combine the step of creation and, and selection into one. And we vastly improve the user experience because if uh, anyone who has worked in a creative studio knows that one of the least good things to be asked to do is to find stock photos because it is tedious work and there's a lot of really bad stuff in there. Um, so this is a huge uh, potential use case for these and it's very, we're very close to the point where it could happen. Zooming back a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about the, a brief history of disruption across uh, media. And I'm going to use it in, in the kind of media theory sense. You don't have to worry about the jargon. We'll, we'll get into it. As a medium becomes easier to make and share, new possibilities open up. And uh, I think something that is emblematic of this is the rise of short form video. So we have TikTok and everyone wanting to be TikTok, whether it's YouTube Shorts or Instagram, who just changed their whole app to be TikTok recently. And this exists because of frictionless technology. The technology of the smartphone allows for the instant recording and sharing of video, especially in that vertical format. While technically it was entirely possible to record this kind of video on traditional broadcast uh, television, but it was just unthinkable because the time investment to set up one of those cameras and lights to record you know, a minute of somebody dancing and then where would you broadcast it? The, the technology did not enable the format to happen. And the same thing is, kind of hap is true of all different kind of mediums from uh, really the, the written correspondence, you know, the invention of the, the one penny postage stamp saw letter writing become huge. And then we had you know, the, the typewriter to email to kind of instant and uh, ubiquitous messaging on mobile. Same from, you know, away from you know, gramophone to streaming and, and kind of uh, the, the first film photography to, to the ubiquity of cameras in smartphones, this kind of convergence. And I think one example of a new cultural practice in images and using images is the reaction GIF. And you know, you you sit in a you have a group chat or you have a Discord uh, chat and you throw in a reaction GIF. You're mixing text and image together in a very spontaneous, real-time way, which we'd had no real equivalent to before. But if you think about the kind of chain to make this happen, there's a lot of actual work that re is required. We first have this high production value pop culture, films and TV that someone then snips out and keywords and adds to a library which is very similar to the kind of stock photo process. And going to synthetic images uh, for reactions is, is a completely different model. And it creates a new kind of way that we use images. This is something that we don't do is create single use images for one person to look at and then throw away because the, the barrier to entry or the, the time cost or the, the, the kind of tools that we have now to make images, it's just not worth it for a throwaway you know, conversational joke to make an image. But then this is what AI might lead to. And I think this is just like an example of how the technology changes what becomes possible with a medium is that's just kind of building on what we've done before. There'll be completely different ways people use images once they become instantaneous to create that we just can't think of right now because we're used to the, the old way of doing things. What has really changed uh, in our time is the speed at which things change and the range of impact. And that's with AI systems, the range of impact. We looked at like the 100 different categories of text that GTP3 can generate and looking at that kind of what uh, systems like DALI can create, it goes from very realistic photographs to kind of stylized uh, digital painting to, you know, 3D renders. One of the famous, uh, one of the most popular prompt add-ons is like Unreal Engine. Um, it kind of 
covers a range of different styles of imagery and will have a huge uh, impact across those. So lastly, I want to kind of talk about opportunities and challenges that come from being at the cutting edge of, uh, of a new tech. Has anyone seen this chart before? Um, you may have seen it also called uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect curve, <laughs> but this uh, marketing uh, company cleverly rebranded it and called it the hype cycle. And uh, it, it works in a similar way, like the Dunning-Kruger effect, that the, the less you know, the more overconfident you are in your ability. This is kind of the pattern that we see with any new technology, emerging technology. The less we, we're actually mature in that technology, the more overinflated our expectations are of what it can do. And then we'll have a, like an initial bubble of hype, which will kind of will come down through a, a trough of disillusionment and slowly get back up uh, from that point. And culturally, with uh, synthetic images and text-to-image technology, we're, we're about here. We're not quite yet at the peak of hype. Um, although, if you, you know, an AI uh, data researcher or someone immersed in the industry, it might feel like it's much more mature uh, than this. But, but for the mainstream, I think we're, we're somewhere along this initial slope. And you can kind of see how it's being used at the moment. Like, one of the most <laughs> kind of popular Probably the, the place people will be most familiar of synthetic images are memes on Twitter. So we have, uh, if you can't read those texts, we got a courtroom sketch of Godzilla on trial. I think it was for money laundering. Raw chicken going down a water slide and a dog with a hat drinking coffee in a room on fire. Hmm, I don't know where that one's from. Uh, but the other thing that is, to, we, if we have this plus this category of pop culture soup, of, of kind of remix of, of very popular intellectual uh, property uh, franchises like, uh, you know, Marvel, Disney kind of properties, Nintendo, The Simpsons, these kind of things, you kind of remove 98% of images that are being generated and shared on Twitter. If we remove the memes and the pop culture stuff, and that might be partly because Dali, uh, Dali 2 has a restriction on generating images of, of living uh, public figures. So I, I bet if they didn't have that, we'd have a lot more weird images of uh, Elon Musk and, and other people like that. And some people might say, oh, this, is, this shows it's just kind of a bit of a novelty. But I, I think I, I, dis I disagree. I think this actually shows people's curiosity and enthusiasm for a new technology. I think that's the pro before you type in your prompt, the text box says, what do you want to see? And of course, people gravitate towards memes and, and things that they already know that are top of mind. Um, and it reminds me of another time, uh, another technology, uh, if people in this room probably mostly remember, uh, of GeoCities. Um, and it was a wild time when the rules of web design were not really written yet. But even then, it kind of generated its own cultural practices, like the under construction GIF uh, that everybody had to have, and a web counter. And these things didn't really mean anything to anybody. <laughs> Someone's shaking or nodding their head. Um, but we had to have them, because that was what was done. Um, and the thing about GeoCities is that we kind of look back a little bit now, uh, those of us who were there at the time, uh, maybe the ones who were too young to remember actually think it's pretty cool. Um, but we kind of look back and go, you know, that, that's so excessive. But in, in many ways, they were completely right. The people on GeoCities were completely right because they knew that the web was the future, and they were right about that. What they didn't know is that the web we'd have in the future would look nothing like GeoCities, and I think we're all thankful for that. Uh, but of course, with the exuberant enthusiasm for a new technology, there comes all the doom and gloom, right? And so, uh, you know, unfortunately, to be the bearer of bad news, I think one of the first places we're going to see AI-generated gen images is in spam, uh, SEO spam, and particularly in the chum box. If, you, uh, is, uh, if you've ever been on a legitimate news site and scrolled too far down the page, <laughs> when you start seeing these uh, headlines like, you won't believe what these celebrities look like now, that's the chum box and the kind of shocking nature and absurdity of uh, AI-generated images is that complete, perfect clickbait that's cheap to produce that is going to be filling these, unfortunately. And of course, we have the doomsayers about saying that this is the end of human creativity. You know, how much should graphic designers worry about Dali 2? This will kill filmmaking as we know it. Is this the end of photography? And uh, it's, uh, there will always be people who fear all change. And they, there is a balancing act, I think. 
because there are also going to be positive places where we can see this. So this is an example at the moment where we see um, AI-generated images. This is Platformer, which is a, a subscription email from The Verge, a tech news site. And because of the high, the news is uh, very high turnover. You know, happens every day. He's writing about the same companies every day. If you wanted to use stock photography, that it would get very repetitive and very boring. Uh, but because it's only kind of disposable media, you, you read it once and then you never read it again, there's not worth the investment of commissioning illustration. But you can use AI to generate that one-off uh, unique image, and it seems like a good use case. And we'll find, obviously, a lot more use cases. Um, so I wanted to kind of reflect back on this, is that uh, I've been told n not to use too much jargon by my wife. Uh, but I think there's, there's a kind of pull between uh, people who believe that uh, any, the technological solution is always superior to the human solution. Um, and I've been ac accused in comments of, of kind of being human chauvinist uh, uh, on saying that maybe we shouldn't just believe that automatically. And it's not because I think that humans are necessarily better at creating images than uh, AI in all instances, but regardless of who makes an image, uh, regardless of the method of creation, the images are created for humans. I mean, we can put an asterisk and say synthetic training data is a, its own thing. But we generally make images for humans to consume. And so there's always going to be a role of the human in the loop in some way. Which brings me back to my original question of why do humans make images and how do we use them? And after kind of looking at what's going on, I think AI uh, doesn't fundamentally change the whole picture, but it does make some slight modifications. I think the why we make images is going to shift slightly. We're going to start making more images purely to satisfy our curiosity because of that low cost. That is why we're seeing all these memes. But if you want to see like this, a great example of this is follow uh, Mandel, uh, Mandel, Randall Monroe, uh, the author of XKCD on Twitter. He uses Dali 2 to just he thinks already in funny pictures because he's a comic strip artist. But he can just, on a whim, generate these interesting images without investing the time to, to make a whole comic around it. Plus, uh, I think this will just add to image making as a way to get social attention. Uh, you can already see there's also Twitter accounts just like Weird Dali, Mini Generations, people just assembling other people's content. But it, it, it does grab attention. Um, and then how we use images, I think this is kind of that shift towards more casual and informal use of images, where it used to be a big investment to make it, now it becomes uh, easy and simple. We start having a more casual use. And I think um, the example of written correspondence, you know, you look at those uh, you know, wartime letters from World War I and II, where they're six pages long and they expect it to take two months to get a reply back. You wouldn't just send you know, the letter K back to one of those letters because there's a huge effort. But now we kind of have instantaneous messaging at all times in our pockets. The way we communicate is much more informal and casual. And lastly, I think that the increase in imagery from AI actually raises the creative standard, raises the bar for human creativity, that uh, it's not enough anymore. It won't be enough anymore to just do something that hasn't been done because it will be so easy just to do it. You know, if you can think of some combination of things that hasn't been seen before, you can have, you know, in seconds, an image of that. So it really becomes not about uh, quantity, but quality. The quality of ideas and uh, the, the meaning, having a deeper meaning to images, is where humans need to kind of step up their game. And it's, it's probably a good thing in the long run. But uh, hopefully I haven't been too pessimistic about uh, AI-generated imagery. I think it's a game changer in so many ways that it, it needs some untangling. And uh, it's not all cheerleading and it's not all doom and gloom. But regardless of which way it kind of leans, I think it's really exciting to be at the beginning of something huge. That's, there's not often times in history when there's a shift, a paradigm shift, to use a really old cliche you don't hear anymore, but it really is a paradigm shift of uh, the way we think about how images are made and used has fundamentally changed and will fundamentally change. And that's a really exciting thing. There's a long road ahead of us, of course, but it's fun to be playing in GeoCities with no rules in the Wild West. Uh, but I also think that after you know five years, two, 
three, five years down the road, when maybe there's less hype around this, we're going to start to see the really long-term impacts of this uh, technology. Uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. If you want to see more nerdy breakdowns and stuff, I recommend uh, finding me on YouTube uh, or follow me on Twitter at Times New Bowman. Um, thank you very much for listening.